Good morning. Welcome to our Grace family and any visitors we might have worshiping with us today. Uh, we're glad you're here with us. And that brings to mind the pew pads, something we do to keep track of who's here and who maybe isn't. Uh, if you're sitting by the uh, aisle seat, please start that down your row. A couple of announcements and reminders. For the month of February, we are collecting kitchen items for the NALC disaster relief. We're also collecting Bibles, blankets. Uh, the confirmation class is going to make a trip down to the warehouse to help work in the warehouse as a service project on March 4th. They'll be taking the items donated. Uh, there's a table that's out um, by the, the entrance. There's bins for uh, tools, blankets, Bibles, healthcare items. I got a lot of stuff today. Put that in here. Um, so there is also uh, there's a kit that they actually make up for kitchen items. So there's a leaflet out there that has what they like to put in a bag to give to somebody uh, in this disaster relief. So pick up one of those, please. Oh, pancakes, fun and fellowship. Who doesn't want to have that? Chris Cakes, little flyer you can pick up, is coming to flip pancakes at us. And if you've watched the video on the TV out there, he really does. Uh, it'll be Shrove Tuesday in the East Narthex. He'll be flipping pancakes from 5.30 to 7. It's $5 a plate and you pay at the door. So don't miss out on that fun. It's Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday, sorry, I'm not a sports person. Everybody knows that. Well, we're collecting soup cans, and you can vote with your money in the pots that are out there. The soups and uh, the money is going to be all donated to WARM, so please uh, support your team and support WARM. Well, I'm sure you all know the news by now. Jim Caldwell, our new president of council, yes, is once again going to prison, and aren't we glad he is. <laughs> uh, we'd like to support him. He needs 200 dozen, that's all, 200 dozen of cookies to take with him when he goes. He goes with a group to share the sweetest story any heart has ever heard about our Lord Jesus Christ to ears that have never heard and to those that are hearing it really for the first time. There's a handout at the Welcome Center, gives you the ins and outs of the cookies and what not to do and what to do so that they can get them into the prison to be handed out to everyone. So please support Jim in this ministry. He goes where the rest of us are not going and we'd love to send a little bag of love when he goes. Our service begins with confession and forgiveness. Stand and turn to a baptismal font as we begin. One of the things we're going to uh, lift up our Boy and Girl Scouts um, at 11, but the Nikolai family are here today. You can just come out a little bit, Jack. Come on. He's got his uniform on and everything. Just want to uh, show appreciation for what you're a part of, your whole family, and what you do together. And uh, oh, what are you hiding back there? Oh my gosh. Okay, one, one thing they haven't gotten through yet is how to be, uh, uh, appear publicly and be okay with that. I know what that feels like. Anyway, we congratulate all of you. We pray God's blessings on you and uh, continued blessings in your endeavors. Okay, we'll see you upstairs. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. Yes. You bet. If you have a chance to uh, talk with them afterward at, uh, in between services, maybe you want to ask them what they're doing and scouting and how it's going for them. Um, I'm sure they'd love to kind of fill you in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Merciful Father, we confess that we are in bondage to sin 
and cannot save ourselves, we have thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have done. We are not of the human heart, we are not of our neighbors. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We we'll continue with the opening hymn. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For 
Father's holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God. Ever-living God, you give to us abundant and eternal life through the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus. By your grace, put to death the old sinner in us and raise us saved to new life so that we may follow him growing in peace and willingness to live A reading from Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. Happy are they who follow the teaching of the Lord. Follow the teaching of the Lord. Happy are they who observe your decrees and seek you with all their hearts, who never do any wrong, but always walk in your ways. You laid down. Oh, that. 
that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. Then I should not be put to shame when I regard all your commandments. I will thank you with a true heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Happy are they who follow the teaching of the from 1 Corinthians. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go, first to be reconciled to your brother or sister. And then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you should not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. 
Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one, the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. The text we have before us this morning is a difficult text. It's difficult because Jesus confronts us with the righteousness required to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The teaching really begins in verses 17 through 20 where Jesus says, Think not that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Remember that sentence as we continue. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth has passed away, not one nyota, not one dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees practiced a magnificent obedience In addition to all their taxes, they donated 10% of their income to charity. They chose not to go into battle on the Sabbath, allowing themselves to be killed defenselessly rather than to take light God's gift to the Sabbath. They suffered the most horrible forms of martyrdom rather than surrender their scriptures. They understood life as truly human only when God is more important than anything else. And yet Jesus said to his disciples that unless their righteousness exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees, they could not enter the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees is worshiping Jesus, which is worshiping God, which is following the first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. This is why not one yota or one dot will be lost from the law until all is fulfilled. Obedience to the law is good. However, God never intended the law to be an end unto itself, nor a means to justify ourselves before God. The law was not intended by God to be a weapon wielded against another or used to gain power over another. The law was designed to set the Jewish nation apart from the world. For they were called to be a priestly people, a holy nation, to make God known to all the world. However, as history, the history of Israel shows, the people understood the law differently than God intended. As with any system of law, the gamesmanship becomes finding the one law that allows you to do what I want, and at the same time have a sense that I have kept the law. Now, I'm willing to concede that this behavior is common to all of us in terms of our human nature, our human condition before God, which makes my point. Namely, with the law, there's always an exception to the rule. And the corollary is, rules become more important than people. Jesus makes this point very plain as he teaches his disciples. He will push the law beyond even what the scribes and Pharisees are able to. To keep. In the first antithesis, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you're angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to the judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, You fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus claims here the authority to reinterpret to expand, if you will, their understanding of the law. What the point he's making is, there's now no longer any distinction between willing something and acting. Willing something and acting. Wishing to kill is the same as killing. Have you not heard somebody say sometime, somewhere, I wish you were dead? Hmm? Jesus said, well, you just killed him. 
In the Hebrew Scriptures, we were given the law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So if you murder a person, what should your punishment be? Death. If wishing to kill is the same as killing, as murder, what should your sentence be? Death. Jesus is turning up the heat. He tells the crowd, it's not what you do that is the issue in fulfilling the law, but what is in your heart. Jesus said, I say to you, if you are angry with your brother and sister, now this is meaning your brother and sister in the community of faith. I mean, that's not even extending it to what goes on in family systems, huh? He's just talking about what you're doing to fellow members of the body of Christ. You'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus is saying whatever comes out of your mouth reflects what is in your heart. And you will rightly be held accountable and prosecuted for these things. Who's speaking here? Well, Jesus is. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the judge before whom everyone will stand and give an account, for the Father has deemed it so to be. Who among us has not gone home or out to lunch and talked about someone at church or spoken about how long the sermons are and if the pastor just preached shorter and more succinct, we could be out in an hour, for goodness sakes. Or called someone foolish or have been at odds with a brother or sister in Christ at some point in our lives. Jesus threw his net wide. And we're all, beloved, we're all in it. When our case is adjudicated for all of our offenses, what will be the sentence under the law? Death. In all these cases, we are dead. Dead. Dead, because we have broken each and every one of these commandments. We've broken them from our heart. And as I said, that doesn't even even go to the point where you've said something to your spouse or said things to your children or the children have said something to you or you talked about one of your relatives or, you know, that goes on and on. We are so, we are so, we say in the military, we're in deep kimchi. We are in deep, deep trouble. All of us are going to hell. All of us are going to hell. At this point, I believe Jesus would agree that with those who say that trying to legislate morality is impossible. For what is needed is repentance, metanoia in Greek, which means a change of your mind, my mind, your mind. Only when we have changed our mind about pleasing God by trying to keep the law as our passport into God's presence can we hear Jesus say, the kingdom of God has come near. Why? Because Jesus came down from heaven to earth in the incarnation. Now fully God and fully man, Jesus dwells among us. He tabernacles among us, with us. Remember the sentence above, I ask you to remember. Jesus said, think not that I have come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. What's he just done? He said, you, Matt, you, congregation, you, people of God, you cannot fulfill it. But I have come to fulfill the law. I am the fulfillment of the law. When we trust God for this, God is able to create in us new hearts. With a new heart, attention is shifted away from the individual, from me and my striving to be self-righteous, and focuses on the other person and how his or her living has been whittled away by my conduct, even if only by my angry heart. Jesus shifts us from personal righteousness to protection of one's neighbor. Or you could say, to becoming outwardly turning and other-focused living self-sacrificial lives. So Jesus continues by saying, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's interesting, Thomas Jefferson quoted this very scripture in reference to our constitutional republic where he, where he said, the citizens of these United States are to be self-governed. 
Jefferson said, Jesus purified things at the headwaters. If you have lust in your heart and you repent of this thought immediately asking God's forgiveness, then you never fulfill the heart's intent. The object of Jesus' concern here is the dignity and personhood of the woman as one created in the image of God. In Luther's explanation of the sixth commandment, Luther wrote, we are to fear and love God so that in matters of sex or words and conduct are pure and honorable and husbands and wives love and respect each other. To strip away a person's humanity and use that person as an object of one's fantasy and pleasure, even in the privacy of one own, one's own mind, is adultery, is sin. Luther pegged it right. Our mortality, our ethics and behavior grow out of our respect and fear and love for God, who sent His Son into the world to make the atoning sacrifice for our transgressions, and during the Father's wrath for our rebellion, Jesus died forsaken upon the cross. Through the cross and Jesus rising from the dead, behold, the old has passed away, and all things, all things have become new. By God's grace in the waters of baptism, we have been born from above and are now to live as new creatures. So Christ in us is now the hope of glory. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Here again, Jesus moves to protect the rights of the woman. In Jesus' day, a man could divorce his wife for anything, any reason, while a woman had no such legal remedy. What Jesus speaks against is a woman becoming an object, that is, the property of her husband, something he can own or get rid of, give away. Notice Jesus' remedy is not to give the woman the same rights that men had. Wouldn't you think that's what he'd say? Okay, gals, if you want to divorce him, you just write him a, 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 a divorce. You know, you write him a certificate of divorce and let him go. That's what we did, didn't we? Did we have no-fault divorce? Didn't we do that? That's what we did. Jesus didn't do that. No, rather, he calls for a renewed fidelity and purity from both the man and the wife. That they remain a couple, forgive each other, work things out. We understand sometimes there are terrible things that happen and, and you can't survive and keep going. God knows that. He understands that. He's talking about capricious behavior. Men going through their you know, midlife crisis and wanting a younger model or whatever. And so you divorce, so you can go out and do whatever you want. No. Jesus is against such things. And He stands to protect the woman's rights and to hold that which holds the society together, which is the family. You destroy the family, you destroy your, your whole society, unravels and goes away. Jesus wants to hold society and family and society and a people together, not see them shattered by Satan across the landscape. Again, you have heard that it was said to the men of old, you should not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's His footstool, by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great King. Do not swear by your own head, for you can't make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more comes from the evil one, from Satan. Please notice, in all of his teachings, Jesus is addressing individuals. He's not addressing governments. Governments are set in place by God to maintain order, keep the peace, and protect the nation and the rights of its citizens. That's why governments have been installed by God. Now, it gets way out of whack. We know that. Human beings are broken and sinful. That's what God intended, but it's not how things work out for us most often. Jesus here is speaking to His disciples. And in the simplest of terms, Jesus reminds you and me that when yes can come to be no, and no can come to be yes. Community is destroyed. 
For who can trust what anyone says when yes means no and no means yes? Furthermore, a person of honesty and integrity has no need to swear at all. For it's known in the community that he or she, his or her words are their bond and they are transparent in this regard. If you're a person of integrity, people know that. You don't have to swear. Oh, I'm telling you, uh, hey, I'm telling you the truth. You don't have to say that because truth telling is what you do. I mean, if you've got to tell some now, I'm going to tell you the truth. That means, well, everything else you usually you're lying about. It's only when you tell me, okay, I'm going to tell you the truth, you're going to tell me the truth. No, if you're a truth teller, if you're honest and have integrity, people will know that, and they'll trust your word. You don't have to swear. Because swearing does nothing, because you have control of nothing in your life, truly. I know we can dye our hair and get Grecian formula, but that's a fake. You can't say to your hair, be white, be black. Can't do it. Age takes care of that on its own. So Jesus says, don't swear. Let your no be no, and your yes be yes. It seems what Jesus is doing in each of these instances is pushing the law beyond the letter and into the realm of the Spirit. If we look at the law as a condition to be met, which in its keeping, grants us access to God, then what Jesus has to say is very bad news because at our best, we will never exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. But that is why God sent His Son into the world, because as devoted to the law as the scribes and Pharisees were, the devotion, their devotion was marred. In chapter 7, verse 16 of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus asks, can grapes be gathered from bramble bushes or figs from thistles? And the answer is no. The fruit of the Spirit is born out of a renewed heart and mind. It's by grace that the heart becomes renewed. And then good things can flow from a renewed and healed heart. Did Jesus come into the world so that we could be enabled to keep the law? And so to be saved by right devotion to the law? No. Jesus came to save us so we can have a right relationship with God the Father and with one another. In Christ we are redeemed and our hearts are made whole and transformed by our baptism into Jesus' death and resurrection. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. It is then in the light of new life we receive in Jesus' atonement for our sins that we are forgiven by the Father for Jesus' sake. It's out of new minds and new hearts, therefore, that springs of living water break forth and flow. Amen.
We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified by the Spirit. Let us pray in the name of Jesus to our Heavenly Father for the church, the world, and one another. Dear Father, you set a high bar before us. You want us to be like Jesus. Thank you for joining us to him through baptism. Thank you that he has cleared the bar. Help us to not dangle lazy arms or drag objecting feet as he carries us over that bar with him. By your spirit, grant that what Jesus has done for us is shown in us, to your glory and for the good of your people. Lord, in your mercy. Build the church into a holy temple filled with your spirit, with Christ as the cornerstone. Give it faithful pastors, bishops, theologians, teachers, and other leaders. Help them plant and water the seed of faith to which you alone give growth. Make the church set before the world the way of life and grant that many should choose it. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus spoke hard words about anger, adultery, and divorce. Help us take them to heart. Bring your forgiveness and healing to those wounded by hurtful words and deeds. Give each of us wisdom and grace to comfort, challenge, and encourage loved ones who strive to remain faithful who struggle to repent of offenses they have caused, and who agonize over how to forgive those who have betrayed their trust. Lord, in your mercy. God, in the face of the unspeakable tragedy, the suffering, destruction, and loss of life in Syria and Turkey due to the devastating earthquakes, comfort the people whose family members and friends have died as a result of these earthquakes. Draw close to them. Equip believers in Syria and Turkey to show the love of Jesus to their neighbors by helping in tangible ways and sharing the hope of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. We lift before you the needs of everyone afflicted by suffering, sin, or sorrow, especially Bob Bauer, Carol Russell, Barbara Muller, Stephanie Foose, Will Stoll, Eloise Collier, Rod Rice, Sean Turnbull, Elena Cooper, Sharon Cooper, Joan Hassler, and those we name silently in our hearts or out loud with our voices. Deliver them from evil, grant them refreshment, hope, and healing, and restore them to fellowship with all who love them. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, be with us and guide us during this time of discernment. Fill our leaders with your wisdom. Keep us mindful of the work you would have us do. Lead us and guide us, Lord, to be about the work of your kingdom, even as the search for a new pastor continues. Bless all who have taken on extra responsibility and fill them with a sense of your love and presence. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let's share a sign of peace with one another.
stand with me? In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks for the life our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places Offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, we may be drawn to love the God whom we cannot see. And so with the church on earth, and the host of heaven, we praise your name, enjoy their unending hymn. Holy, holy, The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we give us our trespasses. You may be seated. stand with me. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy, you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.